Well, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Bill Stoller. I'm the program chair for the Columbus section of ASQ. So I hope everybody's staying safe and uh, business picking up for you. Hopefully it'll pick up pretty soon. So we're hosting this webinar due to COVID-19, of course, you know, which is events us from meeting in person. So we hope to do that. Hopefully September, but we'll have to see how that goes. So as a reminder, everyone will be on mute. Uh, so you won't have to worry about interrupting us, dogs barking and kids running around in the background and all those <laughs> kinds of things that happen on video conferences. So it's my pleasure to introduce Peg Pennington, who's the president of Morse Team. So Peg has an outstanding background in operational excellence. She's most recently the executive director of the Center for Operational Excellence at Ohio State's Fisher College of Business. So Peg will share her experiences in applying lean principles to today's workforce. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please send them to us via the chat feature and we'll try our best to try to answer them during the presentation. Peg will interrupt, we'll, you know, if we have some questions, we'll talk about those. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Peg. Thanks, Bill. And uh, just to say thank you for keeping the conversation going. I think it's so important right now that um, we, we have a way to come together and keep learning from each other. And I certainly do not want to pretend to have all of the answers um, for our discussion here today, thinking about you know, lean management, uh, working, working virtually. But what I would like to accomplish here with you is, is getting that conversation going and having a mechanism that, that we can learn for, from each other. Um, I'm constantly telling our teams, you know, that we're trying something new, we're gonna run an experiment. So I'm gonna tell all of you the same thing, you know, instead of being in front of you at the, at the ASQ meeting in September, here I am virtually, um, but what I would like to do to help facilitate a discussion, because I love getting that feedback, is that some key points I'm going to be asking for in monitoring the, actually the question section on GoToMeeting. I have it open up here and I'm going to ask you, you know, some things about what are you doing with your daily huddles? What are you doing to test and learn? What are you doing, you know, to help facilitate that remote work? Because I don't want to pretend that that I have all the answers. Um, I, you know, so I want that feedback. So again, we can keep uh, learning from each other. And I hope all of your businesses are beginning to uh, return to normal. But I think it'd be a mistake to think that business is going back to the way it was before COVID. We've had a lot of changes. So let's start that conversation. Um, by talking about human nature. In the early stages of, of the pandemic, you know, for some people it might have been uh, the early stages of panic. You know, everyone's trying to understand what the scope of the problem is. How bad is it? Uh, we're going to have a huge business interruption. We have risk and we're dealing with, with people everywhere. So, some people are going to go with this ignore keep their head down and hope that this crisis get, is going to pass them by while others are into this overreact um you know jumping the gun panicking and they with that over overreaction they trigger another disaster to starve off some future disaster so you can kind of get into this cycle of ignoring and overreaction and that's because wow it, in your brain, when you are faced with fear, okay, and everybody responded to this differently, and, and you can see that now, people have responded to the crisis differently. Um, for some people, it is, it is part of their amygdala, and it, it hijacks your brain, and you will have that fight or flight mode, okay? So we get into this ignore or overreact, and one thing I would say is that when the issue of the crisis is passed, um, it might you might think we're going to go back to business as normal, and that's probably not going to be the case. This was uh, on the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal just last Friday. It was it actually had to do with uh, Facebook, and, and the editorial was Zuckerberg's credibility test. But the first line was the true test of principles is whether they can hold up under pressure. And I was really had been thinking about lean principles and 
do they hold up during this crisis? You know, how well are those lean principles helping us align our new business goals in the rest of the organization? And I, again, I think this is a great quote because every person, business, organization has been under extraordinary pressure these last few months. And overnight, we transitioned millions of people from working in offices to Zoom meetings, virtual social hours, and some people aren't, aren't working. Um, and I think it's really important to know that the pandemic, it didn't just change how you worked, it probably changed what you were working on. So you have those two things. We've disrupted that workforce and we're changing what they're working on because because of our customers. We have to change what we're working on. So you might have started a project only to quickly abandon it to start on a new project. So there's a certain amount of instability in your, your daily work life. So I was looking to, you know, what's Toyota thinking about this right now? I would say Toyota has a very nice uh, cash reserve okay that really will will help them through the crisis but uh there was a a quote here from the ceo and chairman of the board of toyota and he said the number one thing i've learned is that i'm prioritizing my learning is that i am not panicking okay so when we talk about that flight or fight or flight mode he says don't panic you know um, I'm managing the company very efficiently and stably. They have great lean systems in place. But he goes on to say that every year they have had huge events. They had uh, the tsunami in Japan that created um, a huge disruption for them. They had the braking issue that created a huge disruption for, for Toyota. So he goes on to say hey you know what there will always be a next crisis we just don't know what it'll be and when it'll be so let's recognize the importance of creating stability in your workforce and, and manage to that so let's look at some of the elements of lean and see how they help you to uh, create that stability okay so obviously this is a pre-covid picture um, this was taking, taken the day after the ASQ Lean Six Sigma conference in Phoenix. So um, we attended the conference. It was February 23rd through 25th. And, you know, I, I little did I know that this would be like the last conference I would go to for months and maybe even through the rest of the rest of the year. You see that no social distancing, no masks. So um, post ASQ conference, what we had done was go to study the lean system that is implemented in Arizona. The Arizona government has put in a substantial lean management system. So we, we spent the day going to their, their different organizations and they have um, lots of puddle boards, okay? Lots of visual management. These are just some examples of that. And, I had one of my lead, developer, lead developers with me, uh, actually two lead developers with me. And we had talked about, we have some visual managements, but they had quite a bit of takeaway, things that we were, let's go to this next level when we get back. So little did I know, COVID was just around the corner because that was uh, February 26th, the first instances of COVID had appeared on the, on the West Coast. I'm kind of starting to think, well, how does lean work? I know lean works when business is usual. How does lean work when business is unusual? But lean thinking, it offers us a deliberate framework to think things through. You know, who are your customers? How does your base feel like? How is flow going to be interrupted? What concrete situations will people need help with? These are some of those, those key questions that uh, when we start thinking about the principles of lean, we might be asking. 
most of you, I think on, on the call, this is kind of embedded into your DNA. Um, those principles, lean is about defining customer value. Customer value changed overnight. So your business model might have been to make people happy and all of a sudden it was about keeping your customers safe and your customers data safe, your employees safe. The value stream changed overnight as well. We went to new work environments, unusual routines, new coworkers, kids and pets and, you know, uh, work environments that became disrupted because people were were sick. We talk about making the value stream steps occur in a tight sequence Will product will flow smoothly towards the customer. But then all of a sudden our portfolio changed. Demand changed. One of the most efficient supply chains in the world, toilet paper, experiences huge disruption in, in what their demand uh, was going to be. If you remember on Friday, some of you might remember this, might have participated in it. On Friday, April 3rd, the federal government started the payroll protection program. So some regional banks um, had more applications in one day for small business loans than they had in the entire year. Okay, so these are substantial changes to, to our business. And again, business has probably, probably changed forever. So I think the first place, if I have an order, I'm gonna say, we need to start here, that safety first. Okay, so if you follow lean or you follow Deming, that very first thing you think about um, is making your employees safe, making your customers safe. So we're kind of talking about virtual work, but I just want to have a note to uh, people that are working in, in plants or in hospitals. And with some exceptions, many organizations have done a tremendous job of creating physically safe work environments by following standard work procedures, wearing the correct PPE, keeping workers separated, having robust standard procedures in place for reporting, for escalation. So there's a lot of great examples here. Um, we could do, I'd say, a better job of telling people how to wear a mask, that their nose should be actually under it, but okay, we can keep getting better. But let's talk about the virtual worker. Um, I remember the day I moved out of the office, I felt like I was at WorldCom or Enron because I was pushing my chair out, okay? And I was like, man, this is like, what's it like when, you know, Enron was closing because I knew I wanted my chair, I wanted my other monitor, I needed to be ergonomically correct. But even more important than ergonomics is that going back to how everyone is reacting to this, you know, do they feel, you know, not just physically safe, we've made them physically safe by putting them um, at home, but there's still all of these feelings of anxiety that people are, are going through. So I'd say that first step, and this is definitely not the last step, I think this is a step you have to keep going back to, is do you have a chain of health? You know, how are you assessing, you know, where people are at and making sure that they feel emotionally safe. There's these feelings of anxiety. Uh, you might have your company, if it's big enough, might have set up a, uh, a hotline to actually help with that. And, and then some of those lessons learned, you know, be rigid with the hand sanitizer, but not, I would say, depending on what your job is, the the hours worked so when we we went to this people are working from homes um there's a lot there's a lot going on in those places you know depending on if their kids are home with them if they have babies at home with them and maybe getting that eight hours out of them we found is 
that eight hours could be, um, there might be key times when you wanna be online that you're gonna work with each other, but then let them kind of navigate the rest of that time to make sure that they actually get their work done because they might be trying to help they might be trying to help with uh, their kids with, with class. Um, they might have a baby and multiple people at home. So I think that that first thing is making sure people feel emotionally safe, physically safe, and then emotionally safe. And then I would say making sure that your, your employee and your customer's data is safe. Okay, because that can create a lot of problems as well for people if their data is not safe and, and we put people in these home environments. We went from 25% of the population to 62% working at home. Like that, like that. Um, so making sure that that data is safe as well, I think is uh, very much a part of that. So I'm gonna just pause for a second and ask you, do you, to fill in the question, do you have a really good example of something your organization did to help with that safety first? Making sure people that are working virtually, you know, are, are feeling safe about what their new accommodations are and their new methods of uh, collaboration. I think everybody's anxiety level is, you're probably seeing that now, is very different in terms of uh, the crisis and, you know, Again, given what, what is happening at the company, it's kind of quiet. Oh. Um, yeah, I had a, a good response here. Thank you, Jessica. Mental health survey to assess how the team as a whole is, is doing. Can we, if we can't affect what we can't measure. Yeah, that's great that your team was able to rapidly turn around and create some kind of assessment to, to measure that and know, because then as a leadership team, you, you, you have real data of where people uh, are, are at. Um, Holly, I'm gonna talk about the, the huddle in a second, very good. Um, so Michelle has said that we had work from home employees take an ergonomics training and allow them to bring their monitors, ergo chairs home. I think that is a great best practice. Um, I had somebody in my company, I could see them working at the kitchen island on a bar stool. And I was like, go back to the office and get that stuff because long-term, you know, you can create a lot of ergonomic issues by not having a good setup. Multiple touch points. Okay, some really good ideas about, about surveys to uh, touch base with people. So um, strong accountability by our group by having a plan of the day every day. Okay, so for the um, people, get, they're getting into a little bit of, oh, hang on to the daily huddle. I, I'm gonna see, we have a lot of ideas on the daily huddle. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is that transparent communication, and it, and it starts with with why. Um, I think as a leader, you know, Dr. Amy Atkin and Mike DeWine during this whole thing, they did a great job of uh, communicating. And it might feel like there's an overabundance of information about COVID in the news, but there could never be too much communication to the employees. So in the workplace, it's the absence of communication that fosters speculation and worry. So share information with your employees freely and consistently, uh, daily or weekly can't hurt right now. Your employees need to hear from you often. And let your people know, how is the company doing? You know, give them, give them the bad news because otherwise they're just speculating on what it could be. 
what steps are you taking to ensure their safety, their health, their well-being? Um, let them know how your customers are. We talk about our customers all the time to our associates. Uh, if there's any new rules or expectations they need to be aware of, how can they get help or resources? And I would say share stories. Uh, when you have employees that are going above and beyond, give them that, you know, hey, here's some things that are great stories that are, are going on. And I see those on LinkedIn of, you know, the great things that uh, some of the companies that are participating in this call are, are doing. There are no organizations without institutional habits. There are only places where they are deliberately designed and places where they're created without forethought. The daily huddle, I think, is that keystone habit. It's your short 15 minute meeting where each team member shares their number one priority of the day and important updates. And huddles have this powerful impact on our lives. Um, I think this is one of those cornerstone habits that you want to keep going. Now, our, of course, our huddle had been, you know, in person every day at nine o'clock and we went to Zoom meetings, um, keep it short, what's the order, who is leading. We actually use a G sheet to kind of keep that, that cadence going. Um, we have a leader that's running it. And, you know, just for the camaraderie, um, they will text me occasionally on nine o'clock on Thursday night, hey, dress up for the Zoom call. So they do some funny things on there occasionally. Um, but my, my lesson learned here is uh, the priorities are changing quickly. So for some of the organizations on here, you're changing products or you're re retrofitting products for customers. You might have to huddle more than once a day, you know, just to make sure that we we create that we create that alignment. And another thing, another point here is that. Uh, you know, all these people now are, are working with home and some people are struggling more than others. So as a leader, I think it's kind of that the supervisor should see that from, you know, these daily huddles, but you don't want to call them out that one person. If they're, if they're falling short of uh, what those daily expectations are, you want to address that separately versus, you know, in front of, uh, in front of the entire team. And I'm going to pause here and see, I've got a lot of comments here, what people are saying about what did they do with their daily huddle that worked really well. And I'm, I'm specifically interested in as we go forward and we have some people in the office and some people virtually, what changes do you think uh, we have to make to that to that daily huddle to make sure that we're maintaining uh, that that same sense of collaboration. Yeah, lots of people using Zoom, webinars, Microsoft Teams, focusing on uh, employee. Uh, I see Phil, you went to uh, Zoom huddles as well. Um, other people have increased the cadence of their, their daily huddles, um, just in terms of uh, communication. And if somebody has some comments on, you have a, a, a partial team, partially in person, and partially um, that is that is virtual. I'm wondering about that. Um, how's that gonna be going forward? Um, great tools to move from whiteboards to, yeah, virtual tools. Somebody's asking about that. Um, so Jessica, cause I'm gonna talk about metrics. Cause if you recall, I started this, I was at, you know, Arizona and there, visual management system, it, it was amazing and it worked, okay? You could see we went to multiple meetings, 
that the system worked. They had spent years perfecting this system and all of a sudden were, were online. But Jessica, I would start with, uh, is there something you can just do with a GDoc, you know, or a G sheet or an Excel, Excel spreadsheet? I, I'm mentioning the Google sheet or suites where multiple people can collaborate in them. Um, I'm not talking about JIRA, you know, or any of your um, tickets where you're, you're moving tickets. I'm actually talking about what your huddle board is going to look like. This is a quick example of my team. They just got done with, uh, they translated one of our short courses into Korean and Chinese. And I had this thing before when we would finish a uh, collaboration on a, a new language, I'd give them a flag if they had participated in that. And I bought the flags and mailed it to them. And, uh, Everybody, when they got that envelope, I was like, wait to open this till we have our de a developer call on Friday. And they were really super excited about getting this envelope. <laughs> they were so excited. And then I felt kind of like, well, it's just the flags in there, I, you know, but they were, you can see that really excited about that. Um, I'm gonna come back. India said that, uh, Hi, Peg. I attended the ASQ Lean Six Sigma in Phoenix as well. During our huddle, we outlined three things. Positive actions taken, observed, or being taken in the upcoming week. Time to table issues or challenges. And what big ideas, people, or process are you pursuing? Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there's uh, keeping that, that team going, I think, and uh, measuring them and seeing them. Uh, uh, in the daily huddle, I think is is really important. Your front line directly impacts your bottom line. So during the COVID crisis, I'd say a lot of the leadership team for some period of time, they're making business decisions about employee safety, customer safety, any product changes that might have to happen immediately. Um, in some cases, they're closing buildings, they're laying off, off employees, and this creates that, they have that decision fatigue, okay? If they don't have a strong leadership team um, that is, is cross-functional, and I'd say during this time, it's really important to be making cross-functional decisions, um, you know, where you have a strong team of people from HR, from finance, from, from legal, so you're getting, like, people that are thinking about the question from a different angle. And sometimes I will be thinking about something and legal has an entirely different view of it. So I, that's why I'm saying the, the leaders are, are busy making lots of decisions and what you don't want is decision fatigue where they're just like, let me get this over with, okay? Because we want all of these decisions are important and, and thoughtful. Um, so while, while these decisions at the top line are happening, it's really important that you've empowered your, your front line to make decisions on process. And the frontline workers during this, they're the ones that are most likely to encounter breakdowns in process and policy set by the leadership team. So the leadership makes a policy and then there's, there's some kind of breakdown in that. And you need to have people that are empowered on that, that front line that can be focused on process and helping to identify the pro escalate the problem, but also help to eliminate waste, errors, or, or any kind of defects in, in your process. And honestly, this is like the core of Lean, is building out that engine of, of problem solvers. And this is why I say now more than ever, it's really important that you have people that are trained in this problem solving methodology. And on the leaders, I would say you have to reinforce that purpose. You're not, you know, to give that, that front line, um, you're, not, you're not stocking grocery store shelves, you're helping to feed families. 
You know, you're not processing loan applications, you're keeping businesses open and how important that the, the work is. And that lesson learned is so important for them to be grounded into the principles so that they're making directionally correct decisions. Um, I always think about that, like standard work will never cover every everything that an employee runs into. You just can't. But in the absence of standard work, if you've done a really good job as a leader of painting that direction, the direction of the organization and how we make decisions and what we value, that frontline staff is going to do a really good job. And now, like I said, now more than ever, the, the leadership team should be relying on, on that frontline, frontline supervisors. Yeah, I have somebody in here talking about change management is becoming even even more important in assessing which projects are are most impactful. Again, that that alignment of uh, from from the top down, and not just empowering your frontline associates, but you have to have that transparency from from the top to the bottom, so everybody in that chain of command understands. Uh, what's the order that we need to be working on, you know? Going to Gemba, I'm going to talk about Gemba. So uh, send me some thoughts on that. Like how has Gemba changed for your organization? Um, this is from Toyota, the CEO of Toyota. Uh, no matter how much we may transform further towards digitization, there will be a Gemba where people will be doing work. So uh, for some of us, yeah, if I, if I work in, in corporate, there's still a Gemba potentially in, in the plants where people are, are making, um, making products. But for some of us, we, our, our, our Gemba is, is on the computer. Okay, so Toyota and lean practitioners, they certainly, they have a strong bias towards being physically present, you know, standing in the Ono circle. But this is really about if we can't stand in the circle because we might have leaders, they physically cannot go to Gemba or Gemba is my house, <laughs> you know, I can't go to everybody's house. So it becomes about grasping the facts. How do you grasp the situation how do you understand what what is really happening um, in in the current state because certainly that is why we go to gamba and that's why um i go to huddles because in a way that is the gamba now so i can kind of get that quick pulse you know of how is that team working so if you're a leader you might have walked by a huddle you see huddles are happening in your floor, no, I would tell you get in FaceTime or FaceTime, get in Zoom or go to meetings or whatever your mechanism is and actually see how how's that huddle going? How are we doing where where the work is done? Um, because this is critical for the leadership team to really understand what's going on, you know, at all levels of uh, the organization. Oh, um, somebody put in a really interesting idea here of uh, looking at security video footage instead of going to Gemba. Okay, so I would assume this is per perhaps a, um, a plant where you actually can't, you know, um, go and see, you know, um, the leader cannot go there, maybe they can't fly there that they're looking at security video video footage. But I I also think, you know what, I want that to be followed up with a conversation on is is there a problem? How is this this process working? Um, how else so for all these these companies that are participating in this call, how are your leaders going to to Gemba and really understanding and grasping the situation? Microsoft Teams.
Do you have leaders participating in huddles that they hadn't participated in before? When I'm talking about using technology to confirm what is really happening, that's more using Zoom technology, not, there is a lot of technology that can be installed on people's laptops. Um, I'm really not talking about that kind of technology and monitoring people, monitoring their their every move to see what, what they're up to. I, um, I prefer to go the other route, which is hire really good people first. Um, here's a nice suggestion. Um, participating in training when you're training people, new people for leaders to actually participate in this and uh, greater participation in job board meetings. So I think it's really inevitable, you know, that it's really uh, very important that leaders come to these, these daily huddles to, again, grasp what the, the situation is. Um, here's a, a nice example for the physical work. Uh, using a GoPro, one person at a facility walks and the team views it collectively. So you're um, eliminating the risk of having everybody out there having to be six feet apart by having a person use a GoPro. That's a really nice tip. Um, scheduling a little bit of extra time. Um, with leaders who are at the GEMBA to make sure they really agree on the current state next steps and have a clear understanding of what support is, is needed. Um, uh, so Holly, um, you're getting a lot of positive feedback on your good idea about the GoPro. And Holly added about using that, that GoPro is that uh, people can ask questions in real time because they're watching uh, a live feed. So nice idea, nice idea. So my, this, this Darwin quote is attributed to him. It's a little bit, uh, um, I would say um, paraphrased here, but it, it's not the most intelligent of the species survives, that, that survives, it's not the strongest that survives. But the one that's best able to adapt and adjust to the changing environment in which it finds itself. And, and I know that for many of you, um, every day has been change, okay? Um, you, you know, and the leaders are asking, how can we help our customers and how do we have to adapt to help them? And even if you're not in a customer facing activity, you're in a uh, you're you're in a support function. That change is is critical. That your job has probably changed. And lean certainly is about building a culture of of rapid experimentation. Right now, it might be a little bit more rapid than you want, um, but you can you know you have to to manage this as a leader. So we want radically innovating to respond to shifts in market conditions. Everybody's market has changed. I'm, I'm constantly surprised, even companies, I would think, um, you may, you're doing testing for COVID. You guys must be going gangbusters. You must be making money hand over fist. No, that's not the case. You have a big volume of work that takes a really long time and, and your other lines of business are completely empty. Oh, okay. You know, so businesses I think would be doing great, potentially aren't, and they, they have shifted, which means people have to keep shifting. The companies have to shift what, what they're doing. So again, 
thinking about our customers, how can we help them? How can we adapt to help them? Where can you model, you know, use modeling tools that will help you understand if you can't go to Gemba, hey, let's use a process model so we can model what that future state or proposed future state might, might look like. Um, the lesson learned here is frustration and change fatigue. So uh, it, it more seem, um, you know, I, I'm trying to, you know, I will tell our developers because they've had to shift. You know, sometimes they're on the back end of changes that we've made quickly in, in marketing but I'm constantly trying to reinforce, here's the why this is happening. You know, our markets are shifting and we have to adapt what we're doing. But again, lean helps here because if you have a strong kind of test and learn problem solving culture that, that can escalate problems, that's really important. Um, my daughter, she's working in a healthcare organization in a hospital and during the height of the pandemic, when relatives could not come in to see their loved ones, it was still really important to communicate with the relatives. So, you know, you think under normal circumstances, there is no process um, for this constant communication with, with uh, the family. They kind of have an ad hoc process, but all of a sudden you had no family members were allowed in and you had to have a way to communicate um, what is the status of the patient, but also a way to have the patient, if they could, talk with their loved ones. So the organization had decided the nurses are so busy that this had to fall to people that weren't there on the floor, okay? So that means all records needed to be updated. They had to be accurate. You know, so that if I'm the one that is giving that information to the loved one, I had accurate, up-to-date, understandable information because I couldn't be on the phone with them and I don't understand it. Then I have to track down uh, the person who wrote that record and it, you know, created a condition. And then it's like, okay, this is a problem. Let's escalate that. You know, how would we solve that problem? So having those, those workers, again, on the front line, they can say, we've got a problem. Let's escalate that. Let's see it and, and try, to, try to resolve it. This is, if you're not there, this is a goal of what we're trying to get to. Um, because running these experiments is really important to our, the current state of our, our business. I'm sure some of you have made some uh, um, rapid cycles of change in, in terms of uh, products, you know, switching products and uh, testing. You know, tell us what, you know, what was a best practice for you in making uh, a switch in terms of a, a product line and seeing, hey, is this going to work for us? Did this, uh, did, did we succeed at this? Okay, I'll move on. I think the next one will, maybe you'll have some ideas as you think about it. I think many of you know David Mann, and he always talks about all these, all our, all our data is buried in our computer. And, uh, you know, with our huddle boards, we, we try to tease those out. Metrics, I have been thinking about that a lot because, uh, you want to have that that huddle board um, that everybody can see, everybody can participate in in the organization. And you might have had something on your wall, and now you need to make something virtually quickly. But there should be some key 
numbers that everybody is is watching. And that might change based upon COVID that, you know, what you were looking at before, um, you have to, have, you know, there's another metric that's gonna give you a better indicator of the health of your team or the health of uh, the health of the company. The downside kind of when going to this virtual is there's so many different places for data. I don't know if, if all of you have experienced this or some of you, um, but having that one place, I call it one place for truth, you know, how do we get to one place for truth of here's the data and this is what we're we're all looking at what we're all focused on and having um having everybody see that and making sure that those data uh is right if if you were in a revenue growing business before covid and that might have hit some bad data collection behaviors whereas now we really what what is the truth here um so data normally would happen in hallways the huddles would normally happen in the hallways now happens via video huddles so ken i would ask is your data still on a on a visual management board and people can see it via a camera or did you move your data um, online I would ask everybody, tell me, did you have huddle boards and move your data online or do you still have huddle boards and then somebody is updating it and you take screenshots or pictures of that? We kept our focus on four priorities, safety, quality, customer service, and financial targets. We captured this in a site monetizer that's available online. We moved our data online. Um, Don appears, we still have huddle boards. He's shouting, Don, I'm not sure if you're shouting like I'm old school or we should move it online. Give me a clue here. Lori, I, Lori uh, Spadaro from Ohio State. Hey, Lori, I take pictures and send them to teams weekly, but continue to do daily huddles. And uh, Marnie's talking about using using things online. Don, I'm waiting for you to come back before I move on. I would say during COVID, you definitely don't want to get rid of the, the huddle board, but what's the mechanism of communicating that huddle board? Um, I always had fallen on the side of, it's nice to have something to write on, to physically do that. But, you know, with, with an entire team being virtual, you know, <laughs> moving it virtual makes, makes a lot of sense. Okay, I want to tell you the uh, the story of the the pillars in the cheetah. This is a um, a discussion. I want to say discussion we're having. Um, the pillars here, the pillars. This is a, a course we're working on, Lean IT, and uh, it has these these pillars in it. And I think all of you recognize the pillars as in terms of lean if you don't have one pillar the house will fall down and how important uh, the pillars are so um bill our ceo he talks about lean and he goes we should we should be a cheetah you know because we need to be agile and fast moving and certainly um like lori's on the phone they had to from from ohio state they had to move their entire mboe online overnight you know to offer virtual classes so she had to be or her team had to be really agile in that with lots of lots of error proofing so we have this 
fixed structure. But when I think about the fixed structure, um, because it was like, hey, just can the pillar turn into a cheetah? Because those are two kind of different ideas there. But but the pillars are are needed because that's where we get our, our standards from, our, our principles from. And I would tell you, without having these things, you know, the ability to coach and develop people, problem solving close to where the work is done, you can never be the cheetah, okay? Which is having that ability to move fast in a crisis. And we, we have to be able to move fast right now to respond to our customers but have ways to uh you know test and learn and test and learn and don um he don buckingham he's saying the lean infrastructure is living like skeletal pores organs and bodily systems yeah absolutely absolutely so that's why i'm giving you the story of the pillar and the the cheetah and they're both really important having that uh the the skeletal system that you know, like Don is saying, as well as that ability to to move quickly. Um, lastly, I would say in reflection, um, keep asking questions. It's really important that we keep asking questions about how our process is doing. Did we get what we expected? Do we understand the gap? And as leaders, reflection is probably the most important thing we do. And those overarching, what did we learn and how do we keep getting better? Bill and Ellen and I were talking before the conference call and I thought all of you guys are gonna have really good ideas about what you've done during COVID, you know, in terms of applying the principles of lean, how they have helped you, what worked, what didn't work. And we thought it'd be great to write an article for ASQ. So if you have some ideas, and you feel like you can share them, um, send them to Bill or to myself, and we'll try to get something into uh, the ASQ magazine from our from our area talking about lean, you know, what's working in our organizations, um, how can we continue to get better, but this benchmarking, how can we continue to to learn from each other? Thanks for your, all of your participation. I really appreciate it. Um, before I announce that next speaker, Don Buckingham, is there any final questions you have or any thoughts or comments you have about the principles of lean and how they have uh, helped you, you know, um, during, during this crisis and certainly you know, I, I'd like to say we turned a corner, but I think some of us still have a long road ahead in terms of uh, managing change, uh, managing how many people are coming back to the office, when having teams be partially virtual, partially in office. Um, Bill, send that, um, I'm going to type in here, peg, it's peg at morstein.com. And We'll share those with Bill as well. I would love to get that collaborative document from the Columbus chapter out. I think that'd be great. So my, I want to end here and tell you that um, I don't know if all of you were as engaged in the SpaceX shuttle launch, is it not shuttle, not shuttle. The SpaceX Dragon Crew launches, I was, but you know, um, I was pretty young when they landed on, on the moon. And I have a little picture of me holding holding up. Men landed on the moon. And this is certainly part of uh, growing up whenever there was a, a giant launch. But uh, just think about this. During COVID crisis, <laughs> NASA continue to work. They have 350 people working virtually and they had a successful launch, a successful dock, and they sent two astronauts, you know, to the moon. And sometimes we say, hey, this isn't rocket science, but you know, they used all the tools of lean to help them keep working virtually to get those people 
people on the mission. So I hope that inspires you to uh, keep on the mission, keep trying during this time um, and keep learning. So I look forward to seeing all of you um, with a cocktail maybe at the ASQ meeting soon. Thank you.